Resident Evil 4, a much-loved classic in the franchise that had years upon years of development under its belt, starting out on the PlayStation 1 featuring the soldier hunk on a cruise ship, to the game that eventually became Devil May Cry and Haunting Ground. Last time, we explored many of these older builds that led to the game slowly evolving by establishing Leon S. Kennedy as its protagonist, as well as the original plans of exploring the Umbrella headquarters and all its mysteries. B.O.W. enemies that were too much for the GameCube to render, and even the origins of the progenitor virus that would lead to hallucinations. All of which led to the team eventually going back to simple zombies before the series creator Shinji Mikami put a stop to those plans as he felt that zombies were becoming too stagnant and the reason for why Resident Evil 1 Remake and Zero were selling so poorly. And so this time, with Shinji Mikami himself in the driver's seat as director of the game, he was freshly inspired to re invent the series and bring Resident Evil into a new age of prosperity. And while they entered the final build of the game, a lot of plans were made that still never made it in, from cut enemies, weapons, and even designs. Top this off with the climax to Mikami's initiative to keeping the game on the GameCube hitting its threshold and a surprise port on the horizon. And so today, we explore the final part in the history and beta unused content of Resident Evil 4. With Shinji Mikami back to the idea of reinventing the series, it became a welcome change to much of the staff who also had felt the series was getting too stagnant. As the game producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi stated, the game was stuck in a cookie cutter mold with shackles holding us down. In only three weeks, Mikami wrote the story himself, removing the focus from Umbrella this time and bringing more of an action focus to the series while making the camera entirely over the shoulder. While many were glad, some staff members weren't thrilled about the series changing so much. While Leon was kept from the previous builds, the other element that was brought over were the human elements from the zombie build called the Dabaman, or now known as the Ganados. Ganado translates to livestock, a meaning that follows a similar allusion to Daba, which means pack horse in this context. In this case, both were potentially referenced as the carrier of something, such as a parasite that would be eating them alive. The parasite, called La Plaga, is a virus developed by the new organization of the game Los Illuminado, a company that wasn't Umbrella for a change and a clear departure from the normal viral infections of the series. Even so, the human enemies still would be very aggressive much like zombies, but the major difference being that they would still retain their human intelligence, leading them to work collectively, use weapons, and even be able to dodge and run. On top of that, there are a lot more of them at once in comparison to any zombie horde prior, but that one may be more attributed to the power of the next generation console. The earliest iteration of them might have been these parasite humans, looking very zombie-like, but still called humans here. This may in fact even be a carryover from the zombie build that they had called the Daba Man, and apparently it was going to have some very wild mutations at that, reminding one of the mutations that William Birkin faced in Resident Evil 2 when infected with the G-Virus. Everything from multiple eyes and random spots of the body, to heavy tentacles, bulky bodies, and even an insectoid design on the bottom with the human on top. A female variant also existed with four pieces of art available, starting with a regular human, but followed by three mutations that included one with a giant bone arm, to an armless design with a massively dangerous mouth, and even a twin-headed version with four arms. These designs might have been inspired by the transformations of Lisa Trevor in the Resident Evil 1 remake, with how similar the mutations are, showcasing how both the male and female variety may have been a throwback to such mutations. Eventually though, the modern Ganado designs were made that looked far more human and nowhere near as grotesque or deformed. However, the modern Ganados themselves even had many designs that were considered but ultimately rejected, many which were rather out of this world. First is the beta version of the Garador enemies, which in fact were two different enemies at first. One is an armored Ganado, which had both a slimmer and a bulkier design, and complete with the Los Illuminados insignia. The other being the Assassin Bear Clawman, a shirtless Ganado featuring long claws of the final Garador enemy. A rather insane one is the one called the Super Dynamite Man, a Ganado strapped with many explosives that would rush in for a kamikaze attack with Leon. Another is the Arcanist, 
an enemy with two designs, both featuring three heads, but one with a black robe and the other with a white one. The white robed one appearing to have a tentacle capable of spraying gas. Next are a pair of Arabic styled ones, one featuring a rugged male with a turban called the Bound Slave, and the other a female one with a veil, tight clothes and a tentacle coming from her right arm. Then we have this harlequin looking Ganado, another female and this one with a Flamberg sword. But moving on to the zealot variety of the Ganados, there are also some female zealots in Literally Plan 2, featuring an elaborate mask that covered their face. This followed by the mouth hidden zealot that also appeared to be another cut female variety, carrying a scythe like many of the lower level zealots from the final game. Now what is interesting is that a higher level cultist such as this one here was even planned to have a scythe too. A tattooed variety was also planned, whereby they had their arms exposed but with the insignias tattooed all over it. A showcase of their devotion. This one however weared a bovine skull instead of the typical ram skull that the other higher ranking zealots do. And then there is one higher ranking zealot who would be wielding a torch. Now aside from Ganados, other enemies were being planned too, all of course in some ways incorporating the Las Plaga Parasite. One such enemy is the Regenerators, which were designed as a BOW of the Los Illuminato cult featuring many Plaga Parasites. As the name suggests, these enemies were ones that would regenerate continuously until all the Parasites were killed using the infrared scope. These were designed as a means to truly keep the survival horror mechanic of the series alive. However, the Regenerator had a prototype that were heavily shapeshifters too called the Lurching Man, looking a lot bulkier than their final counterpart. Related to another BOW looking enemy is one called the Electric Man. Based on the name alone, it might have been one that would grab Leon and electrocute him dead. Might even have been another variation of the Regenerator, much as the Iron Maidens were. But aside from the enemies, Leon himself at this point had come a fair ways with his coat, now being changed up to have no fur on the outside collar. The more interesting bit comes from the new female character, Ashley Graham. Ashley being a character now introduced as a plot point of the story. The president's daughter who had been kidnapped with Leon now instead of being tasked to investigate Umbrella is being sent to locate and rescue her. Technically this was considered evolution to the girl that Leon found that was a test subject back in the castle build of the game that was set to be a second playable character who would have a BOW dog that would follow her orders. This concept stayed all the way till the zombie build until rewritten as the president's daughter. However the modern Ashley originally also had a different design, wearing a coat, leggings and a checkered scarf before being redesigned to have an orange sleeveless turtleneck shirt, a plaid skirt and a sweater draped over her neck. With Shinji Mikami being the longtime creator of the series and now the director of Resident Evil 4, the team wished to include an homage for him in the game. This came in the form of a special watch that they wished to include due to his love of watches. And so within an internal demo that the team made, this watch made it in and eventually was removed altogether in the final game. The demo itself however was never made public, but over time found its way into the hands of a few people in this day and age. But in terms of public demos, two more were at least released. The first of which being the Japanese trial disc from September of 2004, which contained a few differences. The first of which being that the bonfire scene in the main village wasn't there. But the more interesting one is a painting of the iconic enemy, the Chainsaw Man. This painting depicted him without his mask on, the only time to be depicted as such before being removed altogether. Another demo was the North American preview disc from December of 2004. While released after, it was from an earlier build with some major differences. Most notably, the knife was in the briefcase that you need to equip rather than Leon having it on at all times. In addition within the demo build, the binoculars were an item that Leon could use at any point, much like the knife unlike the final game which switched to it only during certain cutscenes. But with the update to this version of Resident Evil 4, the over the shoulder perspective that Leon took when aiming was now the default for the whole game. Gone were the fixed cameras for good from the series and in was the cameras staying permanently behind Leon. In addition, all ballistic weapons in the game now carried a laser pointer to better assist in aiming. Aiming which was in many ways one of the major weaknesses of this series prior to this. And it's not just a precise 
precise controls, but shooting enemies in certain locations had them even react differently too. But an even bigger addition was how ammo was now a lot more plentiful this time around, a trait that previously didn't exist to emphasize that survival aspect of survival horror. And all these items and weapons being stored within a now robust briefcase that you can piece together in a Tetris-like fashion. However, there were even a number of weapons and items planned that were cut at this stage too, the most famous being the silencer, two of them in fact, one being for the Red 9 and the Matilda handguns, and the other for the TMP. Both of these stayed in as usable items up to the Resident Evil 4 public beta, where with cheats, one can buy them from the merchant. It is also worth noting that Wesker in the mercenaries mode had the silencer equipped to his handgun by default. Another cut weapon is the homing mine darts. Darts meant for the mine thrower. If one uses the walk through wall cheat, it can even be found just outside of the map of the first area. The description for it is rather broken to indicating its unfinished state. A few cut miscellaneous items were also found within the data of the game too. One being the onyx stone, the other being the amethyst stone. Both of these having an unknown purpose and come in a large and small form. Potentially might have been gems that you could sell for money. In addition, two unnamed stones were also found but didn't have a name yet associated with them. As the series progressed, the game's maps had gotten more expressive and grander. Resident Evil 4 wants to take that even further, with environmental hazards and interactions on top of fully 3D environments, utilizing various test maps to work this system in and making it work, as well as various early maps that were very simple in design and textureless before going on to the final versions. This very map, in fact, being a very interesting one that even in its final state had an odd 2D cutout of a woman in the distance that you normally couldn't see. Whether that was a staff member or an in-staff joke is hard to describe. But there were even a few areas that were cut altogether that looked somewhat complete. The game was bringing in a new version of the mercenaries from Resident Evil 3 here, whereby you could control one of various characters and collect points for each kill, much of which using existing maps from the game. However, one map that was cut altogether was this one that looked to be a desert city, looking very unfinished with a lot of placeholder textures, rough polygons, and even a sign saying goal on it in Japanese. Potentially a very of the mercenaries where one had to reach a location. As development was trekking along strong in 2004, voice acting was well underway and with detailed care in representing the characters' facial expressions to the tone of their voice actor. Even being shown at E3 2004 together with the GameCube's other killer apps including Metroid Prime 2 and Twilight Princess. Everything looking very clear and strong for what was a killer app for the GameCube. Or so it seemed, Resident Evil 4 will definitely release only on the GameCube. If it comes to another console, I will cut my head off. And if you've been enjoying this video so far, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to further support us and keep creating new videos. With less than 3 months left to launch, on October 31st, 2004, Capcom came forward with the sudden announcement of not only Resident Evil Dead Aim and Outbreak coming to the PlayStation 2, which never fell under the original deal, but as well a port of Resident Evil 4 in late 2005. It was a shock to many. Many felt that Capcom had practically shot any chance of it selling well on the game GameCube since many would just wait for the PlayStation 2 version. However, Capcom cited that due to the strong demand from Resident Evil fans and Capcom also wishing to maximize the audience of the series with new players, they wished to bring it to what was the best selling console in gaming yet. In fact, by then, the whole Capcom 5 deal that Capcom announced back in 2002, which would bring 5 games exclusively to the GameCube, was a failure. Dead Phoenix was cancelled, Beautiful Joe was already ported to the PS2, and only PN03 had stayed exclusive, but was a commercial failure. Killer7 was still on its way, but that was also going multi-platform with a PlayStation 2 port at launch. Despite Mikami's comments to 2002, he most definitely never cut his head off. He mainly stayed silent when all the this came out and in fact personally did go on to work on this port too. The PS2 version however was a challenge in itself. The version being made on the GameCube was considered cutting edge at the time with it taking full advantage of the GameCube's power. The PlayStation 2 was a more underpowered console next to it and several cutbacks had to be made including lowering the polygon count on virtually everything, removing various lighting effects 
and even the water effects had to be changed to have no reflection. Top that off with all the cutscenes being made into pre-rendered video files, meaning that even if you were to have Leon and Ashley dressed differently, it would not be reflected in the cutscenes. However, to make up for this, Capcom decided to include several additions including new costumes, a true 16x9 mode as opposed to the GameCube's faked resolution, the PRL412 which could one-shot enemies, only unlocked when beating on Professional, a 5-part documentary called Ada's Report, an amateur mode, and a movie browser. But biggest of all, a second short playable mode called Separate Ways that would follow the returning Resident Evil supporting character Ada Wong's perspective of the game. And at long last, the GameCube version of Resident Evil 4 released on January 11th, 2005. In addition to the regular version, it came in two collector editions, one that comes with a prologue art book and t-shirt, the other being a steel version exclusively from GameStop, as the box states, but in addition comes with an art book, a cell of Leon, and the soundtrack. As well, Capcom released a special chainsaw controller for the GameCube that one could buy off their websites for roughly $50, a controller that only made the game tougher to play. Following the GameCube release, the PlayStation 2 version was released a while later on October 25th, 2005. Resident Evil 4 received universal praise for its story, gameplay, and characters, some even declaring it as the best game ever made. And even the PlayStation 2 port was loved and to many looked very, very similar to the GameCube version despite the technical cutbacks that had to be made. And in fact, as Capcom expected, the PS2 version even did outsell the GameCube version in the end. 1.6 million units versus 2 million copies sold. And so, after many, many years of development, with some of the ideas turning into other games and some scrapped altogether, much of these ideas did snowball into a final game. From the process of having an infected Leon to the castle becoming a major part of the game, the game taking place in a remote location, and even Leon in the end becoming that tough but cool protagonist that Hideki Kamiya wanted for this entry originally too. And ironically, over time, the game even became the most ported Resident Evil game of all times, from a PC port to a Wii port that introduced motion controls, a unique mobile edition, an HD version on the PS2 and 360, followed by a PS4 and Xbox One version, a newer PC version, an Oculus version with first person control and lastly being able to play it portably on the Switch. Its legacy carried on with future entries taking on much of the influence from the over-the-shoulder gameplay while maintaining the horror themes of the series, whether for better or for worse. And eventually the game even sought getting a remake down the road, one that even brought back the beta designs of both Leon's fur jacket and Ashley's whole coat and black legging design. And once again, this revival became a massive hit and considered as one of the best entries in the series once more. While Resident Evil 4 still impacts the series with the rest of the series even taking on its playstyle, including the remakes, the impact of the series to gaming as a whole was phenomenal, and continues to be so to this day. In fact, even some of the cut ideas from the Spencer Mansion, the progenitor virus, and even the cut Desert City made their way into the series eventually by the ways of Resident Evil 5. But Resident Evil as a whole has a long history of troubled development and plans that never came about. Content that I plan to explore eventually, so hit the subscribe button for I'll plan to be back with more Resident Evil and other games cut content soon. Hit the like button and comment below on if you wished for any of the Resident Evil cut content to have made it in. So everyone, thank you for watching!